welcome to the second part of the lecture complications of otitis media myself dr sharnisha assistant professor department of end head and neck surgery government medical college alappuzha as i told in the previous class when the inflammation from the middle layer extends beyond the temporal bone and reach the meningeal layers brain the dural venous sinus then we call it as intra cranial complications of otitis media there are six intra cranial complications extra dural abscess subdural subdural abscess meningitis autogenic brain abscess lateral sinus thrombophlebitis and otitic hydrocephalus don't get confused there is an easy way to remember this let me tell you a new classification based on the eighth edition of the scott brown's otorhino laryngology head and neck surgery which is the reference book for postgraduate students we can divide the intracranial complications into septic complications and other complications meningitis and intracranial abscess that is extradural abscess subdural abscess brain abscess these four complications they are called the septic complications and these four complications are interlinked and they may coexist that is a patient with subdural abscess may be also having meningitis there are many things in common between these four complications lateral sinus thrombophlebitis and otitic hydrocephalus are interlinked so first let me discuss the four septic complications so whenever you are asked about any of this complication write in the following pattern first an introduction then the route of spread that is from the middle ear how the disease process reaches the intracranium the clinical features which include symptoms and sign investigation and treatment so let me start with the route of spread this is the schematic representation of the middle ear the roof of the middle ear is the tegmen there are mainly two routes of spread that is either the disease process causes destruction of the tegmen this can be either due to hyper hyperemic decalcification in acute otitis media or or by the cholesteatoma in case of squamosal disease of chronic otitis media hyperemic decalcification has been already described in my first lecture so the first route of spread is by direct bone erosion either by hyper hyperemic decalcification or by cholesteatoma and the second spread of second route of spread is via venous thrombophlebitis here the bone remains intact so imagine this is the dura this is the arachnoid and this is the pia and this is the brain matter if there is pus collection between the bone and dura that is in inflammation breaches the bone and form a pus collection between the dura and bone then it is called extradural abscess if there is pus collection between the dura and the arachnoid that is here then it is called subdural abscess if there is inflammation of the leptomeninges that is inflammation of the arachnoid and the pia inflammation of the arachnoid and the pia mater it is called meningitis if there is pus collection inside the brain that is here then it is called brain abscess so this is the dura so extra dural abscess the pus will be collected outside the dura in the subdural abscess it is the pus will be collected between the dura and the arachnoid and inflammation of the arachnoid and the pia mater leads to meningitis the part of the brain in close close proximity to the middle ear is the temporal lobe of the 
cerebrum and cerebellum so these two are the most common sites of brain abscess so the clinical features extradural abscess may be asymptomatic while subdural abscess is a neurological emergency immediately beneath the dura is the arachnoid so it may lead to meningitis that is high grade fever headache malaise neck rigidity positive kernic signs etc here in this diagram we can see numerous uh, uh, veins so abscess the subdural abscess may cause thrombophlebitis of the vein over the cerebral hemispheres and which may lead to aphasia hemiplegia epilepsy etc there may be features of increased intracranial tension like papilla papilledema so let me quote what the eighth edition scott brown say about the clinical feature of brain abscess that is brain abscess is notoriously insidious onset with symptoms developing over several days and the neurological signs depending upon the site is relatively infrequent the causative organisms include aerobic ones like pyogenic staphylococcus pneumococci e coli pseudomonas and anaerobes like peptostreptococcus and bacteroides fragilis there are four stages of development of brain abscess first is the stage of invasion or initial encephalitis that stage may be asymptomatic next is the stage of localization when the nature tries to localize the pus by formation of a capsule this stage is also usually asymptomatic but in the third stage that is the stage of enlargement the abscess begins to enlarge causing features of increased intracranial tension and focal neurological deficits and fourth or the final stage is the stage of termination when the abscess ruptures into the ventricles or subarachnoid space resulting in fatal meningitis so as i told earlier temporal lobe of the cerebrum and the cerebellum are the commonest sites of brain abscess if the dominant cerebral hemisphere is involved it will cause damage to the wernicke's area see we can see the wernicke's area here in the temporal lobe so if the dominant cerebral hemisphere is involved it may damage the wernicke's area resulting in defective comprehension that is difficulty in understanding what others are saying but the speech will be fluent when the abscess extends further extends it may lead to homonymous hemianopia due to pressure on the optic radiation contralateral motor paralysis epileptic fits etc and the cerebellar abscess may present with nystagmus ataxia dysdiadenokinesia etc so the investigation you can write uh, this four investigation in on all the six intracranial complications of otitis media the first one is the contrast enhanced ct scan of the brain never tell just ct or mri it doesn't make any sense you have to specify the part of the body to be scanned and whether it is plain or a contrast enhanced ct or mri that you have to specify so never just say ct or mri so contrast enhanced ct of scan of the brain so both ct scan and mri are complementary to each other because ct scan will give a good picture about the bony details while mri gives better information about the soft tissue details then a high resolution ct scan may be taken to know the status of the middle ear and the mastoid ear cells lumbar puncture may be may be needed for csf study and the treatment include start with iv antibiotics followed by mannitol or steroids to lower the intracranial tension after that the abscess should be drained this uh, and finally a mastoid aspiration may be needed to address the ear pathology so that is the order of the treatment start with uh, antibiotics then uh, lower the intracranial tension then drain the abscess and at last address the pathology in the ear 
So let me move on to the lateral sinus thrombophlebitis, which is very important, although it is rare, it is rare and it's also called sigmoid sinus thrombophlebitis. For understanding the uh, uh, the lateral sinus thrombophlebitis, uh, we have to know it thoroughly about the anatomy. So this is the external auditory canal, and uh, and this is the mastoid bone. This is the mastoid bone. This is an electric drill. See, this is an electric drill drill to remove the bone from the mastoid cortex during mastoidectomy. So, uh, so let me uh, orient you about the location. This is the anterior part. Uh, this is the posterior, and this is the superior. So the uh, triangle shown here is the McEwen's triangle. We have to drill inside this triangle to reach the mastoid antrum. The boundaries are the temporal line superiorly, the bony part of the external notary canal uh, anteriorly, and a line drawn as a tangent to the external notary canal meeting the first two lines. So this, form, this forms a triangle and we have to drill inside this area, inside this triangle to reach the mastoid antrum. So the second picture shown here is taken after drilling the mastoid cortex and the mastoid antrum lies almost here. The, this is the mastoid cavity. This is the mastoid cavity. In a cortical mastoidectomy, the superior limit of dissection is this bone, also called the dural plate because above this bone lies the dura. So the superior limit of dissection is the dural plate. If we go again superiorly, we, we may injure the dura. And here, this is the uh, this bone forms the posterior limit of the dissection, called the sinus plate. Because if we go still posterior to this bone, it may cause injury to the sigmoid sinus. And the, this angle between the sinus plate and the and the dural plate is called the sinodural angle, also called as the sitalis angle. So let me come to the. Uh, sigmoid sinus thrombophlebitis that is the inflammation of the inner wall of the sigmoid sinus with formation of intrasinus thrombus which, which usually occur as a complication of acute mastoiditis. The route of spread is either by direct bone erosion or by venous thrombophlebitis. And there are four stages described for lateral sinus thrombophlebitis. So imagine this as the mastoid abscess. This is the bony plate between the mastoid air cells and the sigmoid sinus. So first stage is formation of abscess in the outer wall of the sinus. That is the abscess from the mastoid uh, air cells extends causing destruction of the sinus plate and the abscess get collected just in the outside in the outer wall of the sigmoid sinus. This is the uh, first stage. This stage is called perisinus abscess. Then the disease process spreads to the inner wall of the sinus, leading to thrombus formation within the lumen of the sinus. This, this is thrombus formation within the lumen of the sinus. And this stage is known as the stage of endophlebitis and mural thrombus formation. Now the mural thrombus will enlarge, causing occlusion of the sinus lumen. Le uh, uh, and uh, leading to intrasinus abscess which may lead to septicemia that is the third stage and the final stage is the thrombus may extend proximally and distally that is the extension of the thrombus this is the final stage so four stages has been described uh, for the uh, thrombo lateral sinus thrombophlebitis the the, the clinical feature, the classical description is picket fence type of fever. So what is picket fence? Picket fence is a wooden fence with made of spaced uprights. Spaced uprights connected by two horizontal rails. This, this is a symbol of middle class domesticity. The graphical representation of the fever resembles like a picket fence resemble like a picket fence and uh, this fever is irregular with many spikes which coincide with the release of septic emboli into the bloodstream and in between the spikes the patient may be asymptomatic due to the thrombosis of the mastoid emissary vein see in this diagram we can see the mastoid emissary vein that is which connects the superficial veins with the deep vein so when the 
uh, thrombus extends to the mastoid emissary vein. The superficial mastoid veins may get encoached and it presents as, as you can see an edema over the posterior part of the mastoid. This sign is known as the Grisinger's sign. So this is another view of the sigmoid sinus. The sigmoid sinus, you can see it continues as the internal jugular vein. Here is the thrombus. So this thrombus impedes the venous return to the internal jugular vein. So it may cause increased intracranial tension. So there are two tests related with uh, this. That is, one is the the Crowbeck test that is if you apply pressure on the internal jugular vein of the healthy site it produces engorgement of the retinal veins which can be visualized by an ophthalmoscope but this engorgement uh, and this engorgement subsides on release of pressure that is uh, while applying the pressure the, ve the veins will engorge on releasing the pressure the, the engorgement subsides but in the affected site that is on the affected side there is already a block so if we apply pressure on the internal inter jugular vein and then release we cannot make out any difference so that is the Crowbeck uh, test and there is another test known as the Toby Iyer test that is if we apply pressure on the internal jugular vein on the healthy side the CS of pressure will increase but if we apply pressure on the internal jugular vein on the affected side there is no rise in the CS of pressure because already a block is here in the proximal part. So even if we apply pressure or not, it is not going to make any difference. So that is the that is a Toby Iyer test. Then uh, other clinical features of uh, lateral sinus thrombophlebitis include progressive anemia and tenderness along the internal jugular vein uh, if the thrombus extends down. So the uh, contrast enhanced CT scan of the brain will show a triangular filling defect which represents the thrombus and this sign is classically known as the empty delta sign or simply the delta sign and treatment include IV antibiotics followed by mastoidectomy. There is some controversy regarding to what extent the surgery should proceed that is whether you should really open the sinus uh, after clearing the disease from the mastoid or just do a mastoidectomy and stop with it without opening the sigmoid sinus for undergraduates you can write like this that is clear the disease from the mastoid first remove the bone here there is a bone here remove the bone uh, covering the lateral sinus then open the sinus remove the clot and uh, this is the uh, procedure so this is what given in the undergraduate test books but for the postgraduate students who are listening to this class let me quote the 8th edition Scott Brown page number 1013 more recent case series have recommended mastoidectomy and antibiotics without opening the sinus. So this is another view of the lateral sinus. Uh, this is the, here the lateral sinus thrombophlebitis may lead to complications like septicemia, meningitis and cerebellar abscess. See the close proximity of the uh, cerebellum with the sigmoid sinus. So the last intracranial complication is otitic hydrocephalus. It is a type of benign intracranial hypertension that is increased intracranial pressure with normal CSF finding. That is we don't know the exact etiology but it is believed that it results from lateral sinus thrombophlebitis with concomitant obstruction of other venous sinus. The clinical picture will be similar to that of increased intracranial tension and treatment is reduction of intracranial pressure by steroids diuretics etc and occasionally a ventricular peritoneal shunt may also be required so the uh, regarding the last 10 kuhas question papers autogenic brain abscess has been asked lateral sinus thrombophlebitis asked twice and the treatment of lateral sinus thrombophlebitis was asked as a three mark question during the september 2015 examination that, that that means the question is very specific that is the treatment so you cannot write other things about lateral sinus thrombophlebitis in the answer so you have to write in detail about the surgery that is the opening of the sinus removal of the thrombus etc 
and the boundaries of the McEwen's triangle which I had already told in the class has also asked in the examination. So thanks for your patient hearing.